Hello everyone. My name is Genevieve Akal. I'm a Gnostic nun and priestess. And in today's sermon or message, I want to share some good news, the gospel. And the key and the title of this message is that we have a mother. What a relief. We have, we have a mother. We have a mother God who is as profound and beautiful and intimate as our father God. Now, if any of you out there grew up in any of the Abrahamic religions, as I did, as a fundamentalist Christian, um, you will know that in our upbringing and where our scriptures stand today, we have lost a concept of our mother for thousands of years now. So we have just a father God, right? And he's kind of angry, <laughs> upset with us. And this was always really difficult for me growing up because if you imagine this beautiful balance between a masculine father and a feminine mother as a unified God energy, one God, but with these aspects, there's a design. But if we take the mother principle away, this one just falls into distortion, right? Which is why we can see we now live in an age of excessive kind of corrupted masculine energy, meaning the patriarchy and pillaging of the earth, exploitation, just taking, controlling, enforcing, right? That's a kind of masculine energy that doesn't have the feminine there to temper it and bring everything into a beautiful balance. Um, and the key to this, and this might be a little controversial for people, but I hope you stay with the message and ask the Holy Spirit to um, help you through. But this is our misconception of Satan and the snake, right? In the Abrahamic texts, we've come to see the snake in the Garden of Eden as Satan or the devil, this outside evil force that is trying to deceive us. But if we look in every other world um, mythology or belief system, most of them, there is a snake at the bedrock of creation, the source of creation, this primal snake, but it's revered. Here in India where I am, the snake is seen entwined around Lord Shiva, which would be our idea of God or Brahma, right? The snake is revered. Same in Southern Africa, the Nyami Nyami. Um, in China, we have the dragon. So there's the snake and the dragon, this primal reptilian energy and force that is revered across cultures as the bringer of knowledge, the one who can help us see through our own illusions. And this is where I really want to break down what the concept of Satan means. So for um, the Abrahamics, we were taught that Satan and the snake is this outside evil force, almost like you're stepping onto a stage and there's this character there, this malevolent evil character that is coming against you, right? But in the original Hebrew, Satan isn't a noun. It's not talking about the persona of something. It's a concept. It's talking about an adversary, but not a noun. It's talking about an inner adversary. So if the kingdom of heaven is within us, then the kingdom of hell would be within us too. Satan is an egoic, illusionary position that many of us exist in. Satan is in your own being. So let's go to when Moses raises up the staff, the towel, right? It's got a beam across the top and a beam down with the serpent on it. 
right? He raises it up in this triumphant moment in Exodus. And then Jesus in the Gospel of John refers to that and says that the son must raise up the, the brazen snake on the cross, just as Moses did, right? What they're both referring to is what comes up a lot in especially um, ancient Indian wisdom around spirit science or the science of enlightenment. See, enlightenment is not out of our hands. From the Gnostic perspective, Jesus isn't born perfect. Nobody is born perfect. The path of enlightenment is when you take responsibility for your own experience of this world and you are bravely devoted to that path because to walk that path the middle way is to release attachments and that is not easy we find a kind of comfortable numbness in our unhelpful attachments addictions compulsions depleting situations a lot of us out there may be listening to this, often people assume that attachments or unhelpful living is something extreme like domestic violence or domestic abuse. It's often a lot more subtle than that. Have you stopped walking? So to raise the snake up on the staff, and we see this come up in many ancient uh, systems as well, right? You have Moses with the staff and the snake, Jesus referring to that. It's the caduceus in Hellenistic wisdom. And in Vedic wisdom, it's the Kundalini, that snake energy, right? There's a spiral life force energy that creates us. That's her energy. She is everything you see. She is the earth itself, our mother. Um, and she is the breath of life. So there's this benevolent, all-seeing presence, beholding witness, the Father. And when He speaks life, she is that manifestation. And she spirals out and creates. So everything material is her. Mother, mata, material. Right? So... <clears throat> As I've spoken about in my previous video um, on I am that I am, we are all part of that I am, the one great divinity, because we are all expressions of her one consciousness, expressing itself differently through all of us. And when we come into the embodied awareness of that wisdom, that truth, you have a you experience a deep knowing that you are that I am. Now, in order to come into that knowing, I am that I am, it's easy to say we can intellectualize it, but the path of enlightenment is not an intellectual path. It's not mental. It's, it's in the body. It's an embodied experience. It's in the heart. So let's go back to the snake, right? Raising it up on the staff. And then in the um, Vedic wisdom, we see the Kundalini snake, the energy of the snake, coming up the system and reaching a point at the third eye and opening into the crown. The process of this energy moving up our system goes through our seven major energy points, the seven chakra points, which also comes up in Judaic mysticism and Kabbalah. Um, it's also seen in the seven Christian sacraments. So this system, this tree of life, is the body. We, we are the tree of life. This is the root system right here. It's inside us. It's our nervous system. It's in us. We are the tree of life. And our spinal column is that staff, right? That Moses raises up. So when Jesus talks about raising the snake up the staff, 
He's saying, just like in Vedic wisdom, that this energy is usually locked down in our three lower energy centers, the root, the sacrum, and the manapura, right? And those are based on, each center is a archetypal fundamental lesson for humans to grapple with, embody, and overcome so that the life force can move further up the system. But a lot of us just live with a trap down there. We live basically in, um, well, from the root, we have sort of addictions, compulsions, obsessions, um, even in the way we think, right? We have abandonment issues. You know, we're living maybe from a place of embodied trauma, which is not bad or good, it just is, and it's the nature of the world we were all born into. We've coming out of an age called Kali Yogya, and it's a very dark age, so we've all been born into a lot of dysfunction. Um, so our conditioning in our primary years keeps us used to living in patterns that deplete us, where we have a negative... We, our life force is being taken away. We have a kind of down, depleted, negative spiritual experience of life. And that, of course, informs itself all the way through into our biology. So what a lovely um, teacher, Caroline Miss, says is that our biography becomes our biology, which is true. So if you live in a state of kind of accepting these unhealthy patterns, that becomes your actual cellular biography, right? So enlightenment is cellular. It's not just a mental, it's not clever words. It's not divorced from your own body. And that was always a difficulty for me growing up in fundamentalist Christianity because I, we, weren't, we were taught that the body was getting in the way it was carnal it was deceptive and i would have this attitude toward my body of like ah you flesh look at you look at you with your strange desires that make me bad because of these thoughts and these desires and these impulses now i can't be like now i'm letting god down right and i had this view of my body as as being horrible against me and that's because we have a misunderstanding over, over millennia now of the relationship of the body to enlightenment. So we would divorce the body, right? And these fundamentalist understandings, the old Abrahamic understandings, you, you're like, get the body out the way. I just want to deal with the descending power of God. God must just come down. Oh, grief. Now I'm having this like strange desire, sexual impulses, this impulse, that impulse, hide it away, beat it out of the self or do it in hiding. That was my, my thing. That's how I coped. I had a persona for my puritanical family. And then I had another persona at sort of university. And I would get, then I would go really strong there, you know, self-sabotaging, get way too drunk and plastered and do crazy things because there was a fracture in my psyche. Right? But what I came to experience later on in my life through my own gnosis was that when I left the church and I left everything spiritual behind because I turned out to be so fractured I didn't and I had all these problems and I had no awareness as to what the heck was going on with me I went into deep recovery and a lot of that recovery was somatic soma the body a lot of trauma and tension release through body practices where I just gave myself over to my body to experience itself. Um, I learned how to Socratically uh, to go through a Jungian process of asking myself questions with my therapist, reflecting on, on my behaviors. Why do I keep doing that? How does it make me feel? Can you stop and reflect and think? Can you come out of living inside your egoic identification for long enough to be reasonable. I learned reason. 
Um, and once I would notice I'm operating out of a false core belief, I then learned how to use quantum energy to um, turn that belief around into the positive, affirmative uh, truth that I wanted to wire into my brain. So many of us through this process of recovery, recovery is enlightenment. They're the same thing. We just have a, a world where we see psychological somatic practices as one thing and then enlightenment and consciousness is over here. But they're actually saying the same thing with different language. So over my many years of recovery, using the processes that came to me, and a lot of them were in the body. They weren't just mental, they have to come from the body. After going through these processes for some years, I then had a kundalini awakening. I had a spiritual awakening, unexpectedly. And this is what proved to me, because I wasn't going to believe anything on blind faith anymore. I don't do blind faith. I'm a Gnostic. I do experience. I do personal experience. I want to know it because I know it here. I know because I felt it and I experienced it. So after a very rational, efficient approach to just trying to get better from all the trauma and fracturing that happened to me in the dogmatic system where I didn't even know I had a mother. I just thought I had a really upset father and all of this was getting in the way. Through that recovery process, I learned to love myself. I learned to allow my desires. If I wanted to smoke hash, I smoked hash. I didn't hold back anything. Don't, it, it's a process of not creating any taboo. When you're like, that's bad, that's bad, that's bad, it, it creates a, a position, a, a chasm where you can fall into it. So I didn't judge myself anymore. I stopped this process of self-judgment. I accepted all of my imperfections and my messiness because that's another problem with dogma, Abrahamic dogma. It's like this extreme level of perfection none of us can ever attain. Because the process of the creative kundalini primal snake moving up the tree of life, being our bodies and our systems, is incredibly liberating, but it's dark and light. She's all of experience, right? God, God is this light, this ever-present love and light, transmitting eternally like the sun. But God is also the shadow. And it's our job to retrieve the Atman, the divine spark hidden in the shadow, the material, so this is the sort of Jungian perspective that we have as Gnostics is that there's divinity in all of us, but we're born into a realm, a material realm that's fallen, right? So we're conditioned in certain ways with dysfunctional parents, dysfunctional cultural systems, all of this stuff, we're conditioned, and then we start to operate through that lens, right? And because that's our lens, that's our biology, that's our tree. So, Satan is an aspect of the mother when it's trapped down here. So, in the Vedic system, they would say Maya. I love the Vedic system because they've really preserved um, the wisdom of the mother. Um, they have many names for her, Gayatri, Durga, uh, lots of facets of the goddess to explain her. In um, the Western system, we would call her Sophia, or Asherah, or Shekinah. And one aspect of her is Maya. And Maya would then be, she's a, that's illusion, and that would be what we would say is Satan, the internal illusion, the internal adversary. Because if I live in a, in a, <clears throat> a life where I'm still locked into my own egoic patterns, 
um, my own, my lens, the eyes I'm looking through are based on old wounds, pains in my system, traumas. Oh, I have, maybe I had a parent that abandoned me. Now I've got this deep-rooted fear of abandonment, which means I possibly try and I possibly people please too much. I give too much of myself away because deep down I fear that I will lose this person. That's an attachment. That's a false core belief, an attachment to a depleting behavior, right? And we have many of these based on our origin story. So to live in those places of false patterns, depleted aspects of the self, that is Satan. That is Maya. That's the illusion. We are living our lives based on beliefs that were given to us due to dysfunctional upbringings or whatever it may be. And the process of enlightenment is a very lived experience of challenging those things, leaving situations, even though you're comfortably numb in them, stepping out in faith. You don't see what's beyond. You never, you never have the answer waiting for you. You have to go with having nothing. Then it is given. And each time we release a false, a false way of being, a maya, an illusion, a satan, we see through the adversary and we're like, oh, I see where my mind is tricking me here. The mind has been my adversary here. It's got, it's got a wrong understanding, a wrong programming. I am here present. I've, I see it. I see how I feel in this moment. Oh my gosh, I always have anxiety in this situation. I, I have enough the Spirit, the Holy Spirit has shown me this. I'm working with the mind in its healthy sense now to really think about why this comes up. Really look at my past. Consciously let it go. And now I'm plugging in who I really am. No, I leave situations and people that t make me feel anxious or that, that, I, that manipulate me. Even if that means leaving a spouse a job. It's not easy. To change your biography, you have to change the biography. The story you're living every day is who you are. It's your biology. So it's difficult to change the biography, but that is the path of the mother. She is the story of life. The <laughs> Look at every expression in this world, every story. She is the great quest. This path of the snake energy coming up our systems, being released, cleansing the, the, the seven major points and opening into the crown and into the heart, that is the hero or heroine's journey. That is the great quest. And when we work with her, because she is reality itself, you will see that the quest is activated like this. When you choose to invite her in and you're not afraid of the pain that comes up, the grief, the darkness, the difficulty you have to face. Because to break through, there's always a darkness before the dawn. She is the story arc, right? The heartbeat of life is her. She is the greatest story, storyteller of all time. And when we start to live in that with her and we start to take our promptings from her, our lives become filled with synchronicities, magic, like you start to live a genuine quest. And I'm saying this from personal experience. I've had profound experiences. My life became so mundane and I was just kind of in the rote routine pattern of a satisfactory life, especially had all the material things I ever wanted, a fancy apartment in Amsterdam across from Vondel Park, which is like Central Park. I mean fancy stuff, you know, I, I had everything that people and what the world tells us is success, but there was a comfortable numbness. I had no, sp I wasn't alive. 
I was in a depleting relationship, but it was okay because we drank nice wine and we had pithy intellectual conversations. But um, as soon as I started to listen and leave things that were depleting me, keeping me in a state of stuckness, like this is life over and over and over again, to be living with her, the journey of the tree of life, your body, is to have a life full of, it's like a child's life. It's fun again. Sure, it's a challenge, but you get messages in the most amazing ways. I'm sure anyone watching can attest to this who's living at the spiritual path. It's synchronicities and the, the releases and the, the magic embedded in it. Because when you say, yes, I am the heroine of this tree, I am taking control of this tree of life by surrendering, my idea of life, my egoic attachments. I don't know what they all are. We never do. We can't see them. We're not smart enough to know. But we surrender to this loving wisdom, this intuitive wisdom, to show us piece by piece. And as we move, we are bringing this life force energy higher and higher and higher and higher up our system. Right? And it takes, it takes us, let me just restart this video. It takes us having to re-understand or re-identify with childlike qualities of listening to the heart. We live in a very cynical culture. It's very mental based. Um, so a lot of us have lost touch with the voice of the heart. And that's where she speaks from. She's a deep intuition, a deep feeling, a deep knowing. And she will just tell you like that. And she's not here to play. She will tell you the difficult thing. <clears throat> If there's something that has to be done in your life in order for you to elevate, to bring the power, her life force energy higher up your system, she will let you know. And sure, there's often a, um, a period of denial, right? The heroine's journey to live that story is like we refuse the call. Sometimes it's, it's difficult to face, but she's always there, engaged in that process with us. She's a very nurturing mother, but she's firm. And if you deny her message of having to transform an aspect of the self, you will stay stuck in wherever you are. You will be living day in and day out exactly the same because you're denying transformation. She is a power. She is a, a power of transformation. And her yearning, her great passion in this life is to move up the staff of, you right, Moses' staff, the spine, all she wants to do is move up the spine out of illusion into compassion, surrendering into the divine's will until she can merge at the crown. She wants to merge with the father. <clears throat> the realm we were born into is in a state of separation, right? There's a duality, yin and yang mother and father, they've been pulled apart, right? <clears throat> All the way down to the atomic, we see this proton electron, masculine, feminine. And the, <clears throat> excuse me, the path of enlightenment or mystical union is, is the, <coughs> sorry, <clears throat> <clears throat> the path of enlightenment or mystical union is the, the mother energy, the life force energy being liberated out of Maya, out of illusion, out of Satan, our ego, our own patterns, the veil, the liberation of our veiled understanding up the system to merge with the descending father. All she wants to do is merge with her beloved. 
The mother wants to kiss the father. That is her greatest aim in this life. Right? And she, she does that through our systems, our bodies. That is the path of enlightenment. It's the surrendering, devoted, consecrated path of recovery in each of our own bodies to, re to release this, this serpent energy out of its one potential, which is illusion, Satan, into illumination, which is Lucifer. I can't go down that road right now, but there's been a conflation between Satan and Lucifer as two concepts. They've been conflated into one thing and then pitched as like a kind of outside devil entity, like a, like a monster with a tail and a, you know, coming against us, but they're not. They're archetypal concepts within our own tree of life. When we, when we release and we work with ourselves, Working with ourselves is to work with her because she is us, right? And in a Gnostic scripture, Thunder Perfect Mind, she says this great poem is being written by a female Gnostic reveler and it's, the poem is writing as the mother and it says, I am sinless, but I am also the root of all sin. So to be born in this realm, material, the mother is all material, every expression of life you see. So when we experience a difficult person, horrible person, yeah, that's an expression of her because they're walking on two feet alive in this world. They're on her body. This earth is her body. The planet is alive. It's her, it's her body. We're living on her body. If you experience um, a beautiful exuberant, loving, encouraging soul, this is also her because they're walking on two legs alive here on, in this world. So it's wrong thinking to say that Satan is this devil that's outside of us and it's evil. Yeah, you get people in this world who are bad and they are aspects of her because they're alive. She says, I am sinless because she's this all loving mother who's given us the womb of creation to evolve in. Earth is like kindergarten of the universe. If you can evolve through this system, integrate your material with spiritual, that is graduating from kindergarten. And the mother has, this earth is her womb, her playground, her field of creation as she nurtures each one of us through this process. Right? So her, who she is, is an ever-loving, nurturing, gracious mother. Right? She is sinless. But because we have life here, and some of us are veiled, in our illusions and traumas and behave badly or in evil ways. That's why she says, I am sinless, but I am also the root of all sin. She is not that sin. She, that's just a person who's stuck in their own pain, in their own Satan. Their energy is locked down here and they're in a veil of attachment and illusion and trauma which makes them behave in that way. But the ever-loving mother who is in here with us and exists as this all-powerful aeon beyond us is encouraging us and wants us to transform the, the snake that's trapped down here and bring it up the tree of life. Because as we release stuff and the energy and life force can move up, we are creating space. We are becoming less dense, right? As we become less dense, because to have, 
egoic attachments and all these depleted things in our lives means that there's a density in our bodies. And you start to feel lighter and lighter and lighter as you let those things go, right? So the process of releasing from the material, from the temple of this body, this mind, this heart, as we release here, more power descends, right? The Father can fill us with more and more light because we've made space from below. As above, so below, right? The Seal of Solomon. We have the upward triangle and the downward triangle. The downward triangle is matter, her, the womb of creation, our bodies. We have a duty. The path of enlightenment is lived. It's, it's the path of recovery. It's anatomical, right? And we need to stop seeing our problems as a, a devil character coming from outside of us. Oh, yeah, that's, you know, I've just had this problem in my life. I keep doing it over and over again. I'm going to live in an extreme state of denial by just saying, no, that was the devil or demons trying to um, confuse me. The devil coming against me. Yeah, that's the devil coming against you within your own psyche. Stop pushing it away with this childlike narrative. Seeing the, seeing the world in this manner as the devil and God, these two characters, is for children. It's, it's a great sense of morality and it's something that, you know, it's a basic understanding that you, you give to kids as they're growing up. But us now as adults, we need to start eating the meat of spirituality, right? We need to take responsibility. If you walk around and you have a thing about a certain person in your life, like, you know, oh, this chick is always acting this way toward me. She's so annoying for these reasons. That's you. Every idea and perspective you have of every person around you is you. It's you. Oh, that chick's coming against me. No. It's you. She is your teacher. This difficult person, this difficult situation, what is it teaching you? Right? So, in order to come into a state of knowing I am that I am and to have mental stillness, right? You see this with great masters and sages. There's, this, there's a mental stillness. The mind has stopped. The mind is just here witnessing. It's not going on loops and going down all sorts of paths because it, its body its temple is in a state of dysfunction, right? People who are on the path of enlightenment are releasing um, patterns and energy off the body, old traumas that are locked into the body, right? And this process quietens the mind. So you can be in stillness and you start to realize that every emotion that comes by is just a sensation to witness. As soon as one identifies with the emotion and goes, oh, this must be the cause of it. It's you. You're the reason I feel this way, right? Instead of identifying with the stories the mind wants to make up, these pathological stories, we can live in a state of I am presence, which is just beholding. Even when we're experiencing a difficult situation, we behold it in a way. We're, not, we're trying not to get stuck in it. and being, We're trying to see the lesson in it. We're trying to embody love through it. But one can't even start playing in that realm of peace if there's all this stuff locked down here. Right? So a lot of people try to approach enlightenment by just doing that mind thing. Like, oh, I'm going to just be the meditative person um, and be the witness, the loving witness. 
Meantime, there's a bunch of stuff still locked into their biology, a bunch of trauma, a bunch of stuff that needs to express, come out, attachments that need to be left, um, right? And as we go through this process, we raise the serpent up the spine. One other thing I want to mention here is that There are 33 vertebrae in the spine. And then we come through the cerebellum chakra here, the chakra of dreams. And we break through into the divine's dream. So we come into a place of union with the divine mind and will. So I'm speaking from my own path. I used to have a lot of my own stories going on when I had a lot of my own trauma that I had to work through. But as I've come through my, my path, and I'm still going through my path of gnosis and bringing this energy up, I now find that my mind is mostly quiet. And when I hear something, it's, it's connected to divinity's mind. If you live and you hear things and you have thoughts about this one, that one, this, too much thinking, oh my gosh, you, or you're not good in this way, or you need to do this, you're not living in div divinity's mind. That's Satan's mind. That's Maya's mind. You're living in a mind of illusion. The mind of the divine is quiet. It's a state of peace and love. And any information that comes into it is usually highly symbolic and um, pointed, clear. It's not noise, it's a signal. You become a signal. When you're living down here and the mind is going and you're in your own egoic patterns, you're noise. Your frequency is just noise. But the path of elevating your life force into a space of clarity is when you become a signal. You're clear. Jesus is crucified at the age of 33 on Golgotha the place of the skull, 33 vertebrae crucified at the skull, meaning the snake rises up the staff and comes across the crossbeam at the skull. Doesn't matter how you see that story as a mythology or a literal, even though there's you know, scant evidence for that. That can be another video in its own time, but we can just look at the deeper meaning here, the symbolic meaning. Right? He's crucified on a tree. He raises the snake. And his, he's cruci meaning his ego, his own egoic mind is crucified at 33. He stops wanting his own illusions. He stops wanting his own story driven by his own pathologies. He, he lets go of the illusion, the maya of this world. He lets go of samsara. I don't need what I want. I don't need this, these materialistic things. I don't need to have my life look this way. He lets go of all of it. He completely dies to the egoic self. And he is crucified when the snake can break through that point. And she can finally merge with her lover, the father. That is crucifixion. It's the merge of our own life force energy with the Father. They can finally descend into each other. As above, so below. They marry completely. Finally, the story, the maya, the ego going on and on is over. Right? It's the end. Tau, this, this is the name of the symbol. It's the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and it's also the letter omega in the Greek alphabet, which means the end. So to be crucified at Gol Gol Golgotha, the 33, meaning you've reached the end of samsara. He reached the end of the illusionary story. He elevated out of it while in this life. Enlightenment happens in this body. It's a process of elevating the temple, this holy body, to merge with the descending force. There's a spark within us that comes out to kiss 
the descending power. There's two powers that merge. You also look at the Temple of Solomon and those, um, the dimensions of the Temple of Solomon is the dimensions of a human body. This is the temple. This is the tree of life. We also look at the dimensions of uh, Tibet, Tibetan Buddhist stupas, right? Which is a kind of different shape. It looks like this. And those are the dimensions of the Buddha sitting cross-legged like this. Also the dimensions of the body. Most ancient temples are built according to the dimensions of the body because that is the temple. You are the temple. The kingdom of heaven is within you and the kingdom of hell is within you. And hell is a state of being in your own ego. And Jesus came to the end of that story, the egoic story. He came out of the illusion. And he merged his mind with divine mind. Because he died to himself, he died to ego. He didn't want those stories anymore. And that's the path of the mother. She's Maya. She is the illusion. The story that we're born. Oh, wow, I'm born with these dysfunctions. I see the wor world like this. I'm choosing this as a spouse because I had this dysfunction in my upbringing. Now I'm picking this level of depletion in my partner as well. I, this is life. It's reality. It's material. So it must be the mother. Maya or Satan is an aspect of the mother because it's life. And then also when you ascend out of that, that's also the mother. Every aspect of life, every facet of it, every color on the spectrum is her. She is every expression. So yes, she is sinless. All she wants is this great merge with her beloved, our father. But for some of us, and in parts of our lives, and chapters of our lives, it can feel very dark and confusing. And that's also her, because that is life. She is the great liberator. The great liberator. We are nothing without her. And she, she is the body that is broken open for us. This is her body we live on. Mothers give birth and their bodies break open to give birth to their children because we're microcosms, micro expressions of this macro love of her. This earth is our safe space where she is with us through this elevation if we choose to do it. And there's dark parts to her, right? We have the dark goddess aspects, the Kali, right? The Lilith aspect. Because there's an aspect of the mother who's, she wants to destroy. She wants to cut the ego and let it bleed and say, look at this. Look at this. Are we letting this go? I'm cutting this out. That's an aspect of her. And there's the Lakshmi and the Eve when, that, when we've let that part go and we've cried through it, had trauma release and somatic expressions and we've had our emotions and we've come through and we've integrated it and we feel the sense of new space and lightness and grace, right? That's Lakshmi, Eve. And then we go about our lives, our biography changes, our biology changes because we let her cut it out and we let ourselves integrate this new thing. Our whole reality shifts. Saraswati, Mary. Right? She is your ally. The snake is your ally. And it's a very real, anatomical, deeply lived and felt path of enlightenment. She is our liberator. Enlightenment is anatomical. It's not some fancy idea. It's not just discourse. It's not just comprehension. No, it's lived.
it's lived, it's recovery. Okay, so I'll leave it there. Please comment below on your um, thoughts, how you feel, your, um, yeah, your, your experience of the mother, or if you're new to maybe meeting her. If this resonates with you, I do invite you to pray, to welcome her in. There's one God, but there's these two aspects, right? And I only could come back into a right relationship with the father because of the mother. My way back after 10 years of not looking at spirituality and just doing recovery, and then I said I had this kundalini, this awakening, back and I had a spiritual experience that I couldn't discount. I was just thrust back into spirituality because I had gone through the path of recovery, which I didn't realize was actually the path of enlightenment. But I was taken into her arms. I met her. And I was so, oh God, I was so overwhelmed with love. I didn't know that, I didn't know that she was part of the story. And the way she was with me, in me, as me, through my journey was so loving. Like, totally accepts all my mess. I didn't have to put anything on. Right? I, it, it's a kind of divine anarchy, a rebellious rebellious anarchy. I'm a nun today, but not because I put on rules and obligations and I'm super ascetic. No, I got to this position through rebellion, divine rebellion. I, I followed no obligation. I only followed her because she was the truest thing I'd ever experienced. She was so real. She is so real. <laughs> so loving even when she's ripping off the plaster or um, cutting it out right cutting out the difficult thing she's she's stroking your hair you know she's not rough with you she's firm and she gets it done but she holds you like you know you're held with her and when I started to experience her her presence again it was such a relief because I hadn't experienced spiritual presence for many years and I felt so comforted it was like so wonderful to be to open back into spirituality but without any dogma religion or obligation it was fully my own it was me and her all the way our private special story our quest that was so felt and experienced in my own heart and body and life that it was undeniable. And I always knew that something like this must exist. I didn't know for sure, but I'd only experienced sort of the rules of religion and the difficulty of that. And I didn't know that God could be like this. And only through that loving re-embodiment of my own body and Learning to kiss and accept it, like the Sufi way. Did she bring me back to look at the father again? The father who had hurt me so badly. Because men, flawed men with false understandings had taught me about Father God. And to be honest, they made him sound like an a-hole. And he was an a-hole in my mind. But he wasn't like that anymore because I knew her. And I re I got, because of her, I got reintegrated and reconnected with the Father God in a whole new way. A truly, truly loving, benefic, strong Father who, like her, accepted every imperfection in me, loved my rebellious attitude. I married him. I can't believe I married him. <laughs> it's funny. Because the father I knew when I was a kid in fundamental Christianity, I wouldn't touch with a 10-foot barge pole. 
but this one and it's only because of her without her our father is depleted and controlling and horrible we must we must reclaim her we must reclaim her she's not a demon she's not a devil she's not coming against us she's in us and she wants us to be liberated she wants us to come out of childish ideas and games and thoughts anyway this is my cue it's Tilly's here it's a little doggy anyway sending everyone so much love and I encourage you to welcome her in and you'll see, you'll feel her, surrender to her, ask her to come and she will come and you will love it. All grace and peace be with you and all glory to the Most High who was and is and is to come. Amen. <laughs>